Hi there. Today we're on the banks of Loch Erne in Northern Ireland where hopefully we're going to try our hand at catching a few fish on the long pole. We're fishing a stretch called Petora today which is directly opposite the famous Corner Grade stretch. Corner Grade over the years produced some phenomenal catches of big roach and bream and hopefully we'll be able to emulate that today. Let's find ourselves a peg. This peg gives me a few memories. In last year's Sealink Classic, I was second overall on this match, on this peg. I weighed in 26 kilos. Nearly all roach, I think I had around 300 fish on the day. Now, I wouldn't expect to catch 300 fish today because it's not quite the right time of year. Well, on that particular day, I snagged up quite a few times. In fact, I lost a little bit of terminal tackle. The chap at the next peg gave me a very close run for my money. I think he had about 22 kilos, but didn't snag at all. And as I'm pleasure fishing, that'll be ideal. So I'm going to fish here today. J14. Right, let's get started. Right, lads, before we actually start fishing, let's have a look at the two basic types of poles we might use, use today. First of all, is a telescopic pole. As the name suggests, it's telescopic. Basically, it feeds out of the butt, and this is used for swinging fish directly to hand. Now, for the beginner, it's not the ideal sort of pole to purchase initially. More often than not, most anglers plumb for a take apart. Take apart is quite simple. Your pole comes in seven or eight different bits, they all fit together like so. So, building up your pole, eight, nine, ten, eleven up to 14, 15 metres if need be. Today we'll be concentrating probably up to about 10 metres in length. Take apart poles can be quite expensive. In actual fact, this particular pole, which is Shakespeare Dynamic Graphite, now retails about 125 quid. If you'd have purchased this seven or eight years ago, it would have cost you about 500. But now, with the prog progress we've made over the last few years, poles of this calibre now come down in that price range. To be honest, they're available to everybody at the moment. The pole I'll be using today, and I've used it for two or three years, and to be honest, it won me a lot of money, is a spiral titanium. The basic pole is 11 metres, but I have sections to ship it up to 14 and a half metres. Now this is quite an expensive pole, it retails around 700 pounds. I've cheated a little bit in as much that the extensions I'm using are quite cheap. That's virtually exactly the same extension as the cheap Shakespeare pole, and those cost me about an extra 80, 90 pounds. So I've got a 15 metre pole there, for about 700. Okay, to you it might be quite expensive, but with the amount of times I use it, the amount of matches I fish with it, and at times the amount of money I win with it, I make no bones about it, it's quite worthwhile. In conjunction with my take apart pole today, I'll be using an elasticated tip. Now in front of me here, I have three or four different elasticated tips, or having varied strength of elastic. Now if you go into your local tackle shop, you'll see on the board that this elastic comes in many thicknesses, some very fine, some to very thick. Now, on this particular water, I would expect to be catching fish of four, five, six ounces, right up to two to two and a half pounds. So I'll be using probably a medium heavy elastic, and instead of just having it over one section of pole, I'll be having it spread over two sections of pole. So, if on the occasion I hook a two, two and a half pound bream, if it feels free to shoot off 10 or 15 foot, no problem. The elastic will just stretch out and the powder elastic will slowly bring the fish back to where I can hopefully net it. These two sections of pole will be fed, to find the right section, into the take apart pole up to a length of around five or six metres. Like so. And what you'll get is, you'll have five or six metres of pole the rig will be using will be tied to five or six metres of line. And then we'll be shipping the pole out. To a length of eight, nine or ten metres. By doing this we'll be able to run down the peg. Find out what snags and what fish are there. And eventually get the fish right up the swim where we can catch them quite quickly. 
if and when we get the fish right up the swim, then we can change to a telescopic pole. This is ideal for catching fish quickly. Make no bones about it, if you want to catch fish quick to hand, and that is a good winning method, this is what you'll have to do. The time of year we're fishing at the moment, it's early spring, so I don't really anticipate using this too much. Hopefully, during the end of the session, or near the end of the session, the fish will have moved in close enough for us to use it and we'll get a little bit of a chance to demonstrate this particular method. That's a general look at the poles we'll be using today, but let's go into one or two points in a little bit more detail. I mentioned earlier the pole in the elastic. <clears throat> this elastic is very, very strong. In fact, even the thin elastic is very difficult to break. That doesn't necessarily land the fish. It's the strength of the elastic itself when full stretch that lands the fish. For example, if I was to hook a two or two and a half pound bream on fine elastic, the elastic itself would stretch and stretch and stretch till it become absolutely dead and there would be no shock absorption at all. Therefore, the fish will be able to swim willy-nilly and virtually break the line. With the thicker elastic, that's this one, the fish can run and run and run, it's still stretching the elastic. So it can probably run 15, 20 feet and the power of the elastic and the stretch that it's, it's fighting against will eventually succumb that fish. When we're fishing rivers, as we are today, I always use the elastic through two sections of pole, simply because it gives me a lot more, gives me a lot more elastic to play with. On the end of the elastic, we attach one of these very tiny toggles. Very cheap, very inexpensive, probably cost 50 pence. Simple half blood knot, and the toggle pushes on. The elastic is threaded through the pole, and don't forget, any local tackle dealer fit you one of these, and it costs you a quid, it's a PTFE sleeve. That basically stops the elastic from rubbing against the end of the pole and being cut or burred. Useful addition to your pole, in fact it's essential if you want to fish with your pole in this particular method. On the opposite end of the pole itself, and I'll show you this one because it pulls out easier than the other one, have a little plug. Again, very ch cheap and simple piece of equipment, and all the plug does is stops the elastic pulling right the way through. A little tip I do occasionally is, say for argument's sake you're fishing with a with the pole and all of a sudden you get a few bigger fish moving in and you find the elastic is a little bit too forgiving instead of changing the elastic completely I just pull the plug out probably two or three inches tie another loop loop the plug back on again push all the elastic back inside in effect you tighten up the elastic gives you a little bit more power just a simple quick efficient trick that saves a lot, lot of pain taking exercise changing all the elastic completely on the, tele on the telescopic front, we use flick tips. Now I've got some varied flick tips here. Once again, like the elastic, it varies on what size of fish you're going to be catching. This is a real beefy one. If I was fishing this peg and after three and a half hours or so, a shoal of bream of moving, I'd probably slip a worm on with a size 16 to two pound hook length, and I'd put a big beefy flick tip on where I could really lay into the bream and get into the surface quickly. So netting them, and off we go. If I was catching a lot of small roach, three or four ounce roach to hand, I'd probably use this fine one. And the only reason I use a fine one is because you're using finer hooks, finer lines, and therefore you don't want to see anything too abrupt when you actually strike into the fish yourself. There's nothing worse when you're fishing with a telescopic pole, lifting your pole into the fish and before you know it you've snapped off. I always, always, always remember the fact that for every fish you lose it costs you three directly at the end of the match. The simple reason, that one fish you've lost creates a disturbance, spooks the fish somewhat, You've got to swing in without putting a, you have to swing in without a fish on, you've got a rebate, and all intents and purposes it's cost you three, four, sometimes even five fish. And I'll tell you what, if you lose a bream under those conditions, more often than not, you're not catching another bream for the rest of the day, so it could be fatal. So the selection of your tip strengths and your elastics and your general terminal tip sections is most essential. Before we move on, let's just have a quick word about balance tackle. Very, very important. For example, on this thick flick tip you would never dream of using a 12 ounce bottom. Every time you struck you'd part off of the hook without certain, without any trouble at all. On the fine one likewise you wouldn't dream of using a two two and a half pound hook length. For the simple reason the size hooks you were using on two and two and a half pound you would never ever be able to put home into the fish itself with this particular fine tip it's just not the power in it. Likewise with elastic. On this particular particular elastic tip I've got a fine elastic. Now that is ideal for a 12 ounce bottom with a 22 or 24 hook. I wouldn't dream of putting a 16 on, 
with two pound hook length and a single worm on that. Simple reason, like the flick tip, you'd never put the hook on. So, with a thicker addition, the river elastic, over two sections, you can, you can step everything up to two pound hook length, 16 hook, and you can virtually catch anything that swims, especially on a river like this. Right, that's enough about poles. Now let's have a look at rigs. First of all, let's move all this carbon hardware out of the way. You can probably see I carry quite a few poles. That bad van's about it, they all come in useful at times. And let's go over for these. Rigs, where to start? These are some of the rigs I carry, carry with me when I go pole fishing. All shapes, all sizes, all got completely different applications. Now you don't have to carry as many as I carry. More often than not, it pays you for you to visit the venue a little bit in advance if you get the chance, and just to find out what rigs you actually think you'll need, and then make them up accordingly. This particular venue I'm fishing today, hopefully we'll run about seven or eight foot deep, a little bit of tow. I would expect to use anything between a gram to two and a half grams in weight. Um, I have rigs in here that are anything between three to 10 grams in weight. So all those ones, to be honest, are out of the question. These ones here, these are all my canal fishing rigs. I don't think there's one in there that's a gram. There again, they all come useful at times, but not today. The ones I'll be using today will be in this box. I've got quite a few in here between a gram and two and a half grams. Here's an interesting float. This is a Trabuco. It's a gram and a half, and in fact I've got these particular stamp of floats, anything from a gram to two and a half grams. I think I'll decide to use one of these floats today. Simple reason is, because of the flow of the river, the bulk at the top of the float will mean they'll be able to control the, f to control the action of the float perfectly. Let me just explain that a little bit more fully. Look at these two particular floats. One's a pear drop shape, the other is an inverted pear drop shape. Now in flowing water, if I was to use this particular float, the pressure of the line holding the float up would actually cause the float to ride out of the water. You could in fact end up with probably a good half an inch of the float sticking out. Waste of time, you'd never see a bite. With this particular float, because the bulk of the float is near the surface, when the line comes out of the loop itself, you actually control the float and very little of the float actually rides out of the water. You're getting a good bite indication every time. Right, let's take our look at floats one stage further. We're not going to be using a pear drop shaped float today because of the pace of the river, so let's put that one away. Let's have a close look at this particular float Again, it's the same shape as the Trabuco float, but the difference this time is it's got a wire stem. Now what should you ask be the difference between having a wire stem and a cane stem? On very pacey water, you'll find that if you use a cane stem, because of the slightly wider diameter and the less, how can we put it, the less ballast at the bottom of the float, you'll tend to see the float, stop that one a minute, ride up in the water like so. In other words, the pressure of the water is lifting the base of the float. You end up having the line coming through the float, out the bottom, and down like so. So if you get any sort of bite, the first thing that happens is the float drops on itself. That's not often a good thing. With the wire stem float, that doesn't happen. Because it's much thinner and got a little bit more weight to it, the current actually pushes past the float and doesn't lift the float itself up. So in other words, you get a continual line from your line, through your float, through your rubbers on your stem, down to your rig, and everything's in, in parallel. So if the bite occurs, the float goes straight the way under. I'm a bit undecided what I actually I'm going to do today because the pace of the water is slightly varying from time to time. So initially what I'm going to do is, on the wire stem float, I'm going to use a, probably a two or two and a half gram on a short line, four or five meters in length and fish at nine meters from the bank. In other words, I'm gonna use this four meters to hand and ship up to nine meters. 
and on the cane stem float I'm going to put that on seven meters to hand with probably a, a two grammer. At this stage of the game I think it might be of interest to actually show us making a rig itself up. We've seen these rigs already made up, we've never gone into detail exactly how we mount the, mount the float itself on the line, attach the olivet, the drop shots and the hook itself. So let's do that now. This is what we need. Right, first things, the float. We need some rubbers for the float itself, for holding it on the line. A winder. A set of style pincers. These will be used for actually putting the drop shots on. The line itself, of course. A hook. As you can see on, this particular, on these particular hooks, I've actually wound them around a piece of cardboard for convenience. Very useful and very cheap little thing to do that. Some legal lead shots, some style leads, and the bulk Olivet itself. Before we go any further, let's have a look at these Olivets a bit more closely. A tungsten Olivet from Streamline, and a, let's get one out of the pack. A lock and slide Olivet from Snapshot. And recently, these are the two non-toxics I've been using. There's the two. And as you can see, the lock and slide Olivet is a fair bit bigger than the tungsten Olivet. The reason is simple, tungsten is a much heavier, denser material. Therefore, we can get away with using a much smaller piece of tungsten than you can of this, I don't honestly know what this is, it might be a brass or a, or a bronze alloy, which is considerably smaller. But these do have the advantages over these at times. This particular Olivet is actually locked onto the line by means of two pegs either end and a simple rubber sleeve. Therefore they, they can be slid up and down the line quite easily. On this particular Olivet, there's a piece of rubber that goes through the middle of the Olivet itself. The line is then passed through that Olivet and in order to lock it on the line itself, you can either put a little plastic peg at the bottom or, as I use, a little bit of a matchstick. Now I find a matchstick to be better and the reason is quite simple. When the matchstick actually pushed into the base of the float and the water absorbs into the matchstick, it tends to make it swell a little bit and it locks nice and firmly onto the line and doesn't slip up and down at all. And today I'm going to be using one of these Streamline Olivets. So where do we start? First of all let's get our line. Today I'm using pound and a half breaking strain line. It's all personal preference. I'm using Bayer today. I know a lot of anglers use Maxima, Croik or wherever. I found Bayer a very good resilient line. It's a good all round line. And over the years I've used it for 10, 12 years. Never had any problems at all. First thing we do is make sure the line has got a nice clean end. Here's my blade. That's very important more often than not, you've got a little bird on the end of the line itself, you can never thread the blooming thing through the eye of the float itself. First things first, we thread the line through the top of the pole float itself, through the ring. We then pass the line through a couple of float rubbers. Now I'll say two float rubbers and I'll explain why in a minute. Always wet the base of the float and you find these silicon float rubbers slide on a lot more easy. Slide the silicon float rubber on and the second one. Now the first float rubber actually lies right at the base of the float itself. The second float rubber is then slid up just to beneath the body. That then means the line hugs the float all the way down. It's perfect. I find these silicon float rubbers a little bit better than the plastic ones because it gives me a little bit more manoeuvrability when I want to actually slide the float up the line itself. Like so. Right, stage two. Find the end of 
the line again and thread the line through the olivet. Not as often as not as easy as it seems, like so. Now for the difficult bit, let's find ourselves a match. Being a non-smoker, that's a difficult bit. Right. First thing we do is sharpen the match off to a sharp point. Make sure, just a, just a quick point, make sure when you thread the olivet itself, you always thread through the thin end first and the line comes out the bottom by the thick end. All olivets are always put on this way, simply because when you actually strike, you want the olivet to cut cleanly through the water. If it's the other way around, you can imagine the fact there's a bulk there, a bit of a, a ram force effect against that olivet. This is then plugged with the match, pushed in and then snaps off just at the base. Quick push in with the thumbnail and trim the last little bit off. And there we go, the Olivet then stays in position on the line and you can slide it wherever you want. That is perfect. In fact, that's come out better than it normally comes out. At this stage of the game, we've now got our float and our olivet. The next thing to do is put the hook length on and the drop shots. Now I always use a simple half blood loop on the bottom of the, of the line itself, in other words, half a granny knot, so it forms a loop. Snap the trailing length off, let's put that down a second. And don't forget lads, wherever you are, take your little bits of line about. Probably hear the birds tweeting in the distance, so we don't want to cause any damage to them. I'm not going to put the hook on yet, because you can imagine when you're setting these up, you don't want the hook catching everywhere. Next thing I'm going to do is put the drop shots itself on. Now this particular float is a 1.5 gram. This Olivet, is 1.25 gram. So we'd estimate we want a 0.25 gram drop shot. Now I'm not going to put one drop shot on, I'm going to put two very small styles. Now these are little elongated slotted pieces of lead. They actually clip onto the line by means of using a special set of pliers. We call them style pincers. There are two or three different ways of actually putting these styles onto the line itself. Make sure your styles are, are clean, otherwise you can't quite pick them up. <coughs> the one method is to actually pinch the style. It's quite tricky. And actually hold it between the pincers and locate it on the line like so. And then just squeeze gently. That style lead is now on the line. Like small shots, they do freely go up and down the line. And because of the design, they don't damage the line. Let's put another one of those on, because I think it will take two or possibly three of those. Oops, so easy. A job, I must add, this is always best done at home, not actually on the bank.
find the slot, pinch it into position, that's it, you now have two on the line. Third thing, the hook length. This particular hook I have mounted to a pound breaking strain line. You notice, very short hook length, six or eight inches. That is then attached to the loop at the base by means of a half blood knot. You know, put the line through, give it a spin and thread it through on its own loop. Quick pull, trim and that's a hook in position. Slide and drop shots down. Put my bulk about 10-12 inches above my hook and slide float up accordingly. Now for fine adjustment you always oops, for fine adjustment you amend the floating shot capacity when it's actually rigged up to float itself. But we won't be doing that quite yet. Let's put the rig itself that is now made up to about four meters of line on a winder. Always put the hook first. Yep. hook onto one of the bars across the winder and progressively wind the rig around so few turns around there and put it on that little peg you see that little peg at the end Trailing line on the end of the peg, we then have a completed winder, all ready to go. Now let's have a look at the baits. We've looked at the poles, we've looked at the terminal tackle, but the most important aspect of all fishing as far as I'm concerned is the correct use of bait. I'll be using three basic hook baits today, and feed baits, and quite a simple mix of ground bait. Let's start first of all with the humble maggot. In this bait can, we have a couple of pints of dark red maggots. Now for some reason in Ireland these are far more popular than any other colour. I know in England we use a majority of bronze maggots and we lose feed a lot of bronze maggots. But while we're fishing over here, so long as the fish are accustomed to using red maggots, there's any reason why we shouldn't stick with those. Put the lid on now, save them getting the light. The second most important bait is the caster. Now, as you all know, the caster is the chrysalis of the maggot. But it goes through one or two different stages as it gets darker and darker. As you can see here, there's some very light casters. Those have only just turned from a maggot itself. Likewise, there's some very some dark casters. Now that one is just about to turn to a floater. In other words, a little bit darker, a little air bubble inside tends to generate itself and it will then float on the surface. That is no good at all. You end up having more seagulls in your peg than fish, if you're not careful. Yeah, it's just a sinker, that one. Now these are a super feed bait, especially for bream. They lie on the bottom, they don't crawl under stones and daft things like that, and the fish home in on them beautifully. Super bait, and we're using a couple of three pints of these today. Oh, if you did notice, well, I keep them in a, in, a, in a plastic box. I always wrap a plastic bag over the top and then put the lid on top. That saves the air getting in because the more air that gets in, the quicker they turn to floaters. And halfway through a competition, that's the last thing we want. The third hook bait we'll be using is the humble earthworm. A super bait for bream and also a good bait for catching an occasional big roach. Widely used in England, on bream competitions, and even so, more so in Ireland. Now if you look at this particular worm, it's a very dark red colour. It's a red worm rather than a brandling, and I prefer these for the simple reason they're much more lively when they're on the hook itself. 
There's nothing more tempting than one of those for bream. To introduce this feed, we have two methods. We can either loose feed or use a little bit of ground bait. On this particular peg today, because of the pace and I suspect a few bream in the area, we're going to introduce the majority of the feed in ground bait. The mix is going to be quite simple. Out with the old ground bait tray. The mix I'm going to do today will cover all eventualities. The basic stock item will be a bulking agent, which is secret ground bait, secret ground bait, which is about a third of a bag. I like to use this super cup as an attractor. It keeps fizzing and bubbling around the bottom. Quite nice. And a little bit of ordinary breadcrumb. If I was in England, I don't think I'd use a breadcrumb. I'd just stick to the, the specialist ground bait. Whereas, we would expect to catch quite a few fish here, and they're not that fussy. There's a little bit of extra bulk, a little bit of ordinary breadcrumb. Never did any harm at all. Just mix that round. Right. I'm also going to add a little dash of brasm. Now, evidently this comes from the continent. It's supposed to be a bream attractor. I've had some good weights of bream over here the last four or five years and I've used it all the time so I've got no reason to disbelieve it doesn't do its job. I'm sure there might be a few of out there that disagree with me but confidence is the essence in mixing your ground base. So a little bit of brasm, not a great deal, just a quarter of a sachet or something like that. The final addition to the mix, an additive that, to be honest, has been with us for years and years and years, and I've used it for years and years and years. Go back to six or seven years ago, all we ever used to use was this and standard breadcrumb. This is crushed hemp seed. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's a must for roach in England, Ireland, wherever you go. Hemp seed is one of the best attractors you can use. In a crushed form, it gives off lovely oils and attractors all the time. It's a super addition to any ground bait, especially if you go to the quarry. I'll show you a little bit. You see the little cusks and what of hemp seed? They all bubble off the bottom and the oil comes seeping out of those. It's super. Right, so I'll mix all that in. Now the difficult bit. Mixing the water. Let's move these bags out of the way. Now, if, if I was fishing a competition, especially a big competition, I'd probably mix this just before I get to the match itself. Only an hour or so before. But when we come to Ireland, sometimes we miss great big trays of this, and it does take a long time to mix up. But today, for a pleasure fishing session, I've got no competition to beat, only the fish themselves. So I'm going to mix it on the rack. Most important thing to do is never put too much water into any one time. Little and often, that's the object. Dash of water, swish it round, start to get the mix to come together. You can see there, even that little dash of water, I'm starting to get a little bit of a binding effect. Nowhere near ready yet. Let's give it a few seconds just to absorb that little bit of moisture. And add a bit more. Switch it round. And here we go again. Now that's mixing up nicely now. Dig into the corners, make sure all the mix is fluffed up. The last thing you want is, especially in a competition, is inconsistent ground bait because you're pulling those fish up this swim all the time all of a sudden you've dropped one loose ball of ground bait in it breaks up too quick and before you know it you're taking the fish down your peg an extra few yards oh, that's 
So add a drop more water. It's coming together nicely now. Swish it round. That's coming together really well now. Start to bind, but it's not getting too cloggy. If you noticed, if I pick it up, it's still quite fluffy. If I squeeze it, it holds together in a lovely lump. If I try and break it again, it falls together nicely. This is coming together quite well now. The only problem with this mix is, in fact with any mix of the bulk ground bait, is that it does take four or five minutes to absorb the water. And I would assume in four or five minutes we'll have to add a little bit more water to that, just to get the right consistency. Excellent. Well, four or five minutes, yeah, as I said, look, loosely bound dry again. There's nothing worse than doing that, it's right at the start of the match and all of a sudden before you know it, you've got to start mixing your ground bait again. Well, it is very damp, it just doesn't bind. So it only takes another dash of water to bring it up perfectly. Look at that, straight away. Only a few few cc's and beautiful. Now I'm a great fan of riddling my ground bait. 99% out of time, 99% of times in Ireland there's no need. But to be honest, in this particular batch of ground bait, I've noticed one or two little impurities that I don't want. And I'm sure it came from the brown ground bait. I've noticed one or two little bits of plastic. Let's have a look. Doesn't need to be an accurate riddle. Just take out the big lumps, majority of the big lumps. Most of this is going straight through, see? Yeah, look at this. A little bit of paper. You've got to realise the majority of the, the breadcrumb you get in tackle shops comes straight from the straight from the bakers. Could be sweepings off the off the oven floor wherever. You get all sorts of little bits of impurities in it. And there's nothing better than taking them all out. Anyway, if you look closer, there's a few little bits of plastic paper and a little bit of one of those red tabs you get off one of the, the bakery wrappers. There you are. Nice fluffy ground bait that when I squeeze it binds firmly. Yeah, in five or six minutes. Perfect. If you watch closely, although I've only thrown that in shallow water, you can see all the surface bubbling little bits coming off. See them? Little little bits of oil coming, that's off the hemp seed. You can imagine that happening in the, on the bottom, an eight or nine foot of water. That must be a real attractor. That'll bubble for an hour, hour and a half. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's bound to pull some fish in today, that is. Well, that's the ground bait mixed up. Final ingredient to the ground bait, of course, is our face. Now this is always trial and error, believe you me. It's a load of fish in your peg, sometimes it pays for a lot, of, a lot of feeding. But for today, we're pleasure fishing, there's no objection trying to take fish off anybody else. So we're just going to put a small handful of casters in, and just a pinch of red maggots. That now is ready to start fishing with. Let's get going. See the weather's changed quite considerably over the last 15 or 20 minutes. In fact, in the time it's taken me to settle and get all my, all my equipment around me, it's turned for me quite a miserable looking afternoon. And it's turned out to be quite nice. So let's get this jacket off and let's catch a few fish. Right, before I actually put some feed in, let's look at the, uh, the tackle layout. Keep nets always strategically placed on my left hand side. So if I do happen to start catching quite quickly, drop the fish in, no missing about. 
I keep all my ground baits and all my hook baits on this little stand at the side of me. That's just for convenience. When I'm fishing the pole and I'm catching, I like to feed left-handed. Just a matter of handing the ground bait. Off we go. Hook baits always at hand. Normally, I use this little thing with a few baits in it. But today, for convenience, as I'm only using maggots on the hook, that's where they're staying. Useful piece of equipment here, the pole rest. All that happens with that is the pole drops in there. For argument's sake, if you, want to, if, you, if you start catching fish just legging it on, you don't feel like holding your pole all the time, it gets a little bit heavy, drop it in the rest, no problem. <clears throat> Landing net, always on my left hand side. Playing the fish with the right hand, fish comes in, nets, unhooks, fish in the net. Always return the landing net back to original position. What I tend to do if I am catching very quickly, I always drop the landing net on top of my keep net. Poles, both accessible. From the left hand side and behind me. Anything else? Worms, casters, anything else I need. All I'm trying to say is that once you start fishing, you want to be as efficient as possible. Now getting up, walking around, it's all wasted time. Before I actually talk about rigs, I think it's a good idea to actually get some ground bait into the swim and that will give you time to settle and hopefully a few bream and roach and whatever might move on. <coughs> First thing to do is to locate exactly where you want to throw your bait. Now I intend on fishing between nine and a half and ten metres out from the bank today. So to get a, a guide as to where I should find a depth of about seven foot. Drop the pole on the roller. Not on the roller, sorry, on the... <clears throat> just set it so it's just off, off the water level. Make up three or four balls of ground bait. Put a few casters in these balls, because I'm convinced we're going to catch more bream than roach today. Well, weight-wise, we probably might have, numbers-wise, we'll probably end up with a few more roach, but weight-wise, definitely more green. Then, using the end of your pole as a guide, you know where to drop it. One thing, when you are doing this, try to avoid hitting the pole. I've seen people actually break the last six or eight inches of the pole off by just throwing the ground bait in. Let's just get these in, see how we go. Now these are quite hard because it's quite pacey today. So when you go to the bottom, settle and break up slowly. So I've made the balls quite substantial. One. Two. It's a little bit short. Four. Right, let's leave that. For a few minutes and have a look at the rigs I'm using today. Start with this one. It's a five and a half metre pole initially, which will be fed with the extra two or three sections out to nine metres. The hook length is two pound breaking strain with a size 16 hook. I'm using a quite a fine wire 16 hook at the moment. If in any case, any bigger fish moving, I might step that up. But at the moment, to cover all eventualities, I'm using that. 10 or 12 inches above the hook, I've got my first style. This is a number 12. Four or five inches above that, the second, and another four or five inches above that, the third. The bulk itself, the Tungsten Olivet, is a gram and three quarters. Moving up to the float itself. If you notice the float is the conventional pear drop shaped but with the bulk at the top of the float. Because the, the water is quite pacey today I need the buoyancy of the top just to give me that extra little, extra little bit of control. I'm making sure I don't snag the hook. So, this is the business end. The main line is attached to a standard plastic connector. The toggle itself actually has a sleeve on the outside which pushes back and allows you to 
pass the loop of line over it and lock it in position. This is connected to some quite heavy elastic today. As I says, because of the pace, and we expect to catch some bream, at least I want some, some reasonable control over, over what I'm doing. In the tip of the pole, we have the PTFE tip. And as I mentioned earlier, we're using elastic that goes through the N2 sections. If I was to hook a fish around two or three pound lists, I would imagine it'll stretch a good 20 or 30 feet. that one off for the time being. Let's have a look at the other rig. The second rig I'll be using today, lots of trees, <coughs> consists of an eight metre pole with a line coming right to the butt itself. If and when any roach move into the peg, and I'm hoping they will today, I feel like catching a little bit more quickly. It's a matter of swinging out, hooking the fish and swinging them directly to hand, or netting them depending on the size. The rig itself, it's fairly similar, though a little bit heavier. Because I need the momentum to get the float into the water, because I've got a lot more line, I've had to step up the float just a fraction. Again, I'm going to start on a size 16 hook. This time it's to a pound and a half breaking strain. I have, instead of styles this time, three small dropper shots. Just split those two up. Equally spaced over the last two foot. And my bulk, once again, a tungsten olivet. This time it's two and a half grams. The float will pump to something a little different this time. It's got a very thick fluorescent tip in. It not only gives me a, a, good, a good view of the float as it runs down the swim, but it is buoyant. And these last two dropper shots can actually take that float right the way down to the tip if necessary. It's got a, an aluminium, well an alloy stem, and you notice the body is completely reverse to the, to the other rig I'll be using. It's an inverted pear drop. With this particular rig, I won't have the control over the rigs as I do with my other sections. So what I intend on doing is, when the fish do actually move in, this will be just running down the peg with the flow. Very little control. I'm just relying on the numbers of fish being there, determining what I'm going to catch. Let's just push that back. Now instead of elastic this time, I should never do this, one of these days I'm going to break this pole. Instead of the elastic this time, I'm coming off a fairly substantial flick tip. I use this type of flick tip if I'm, for argument's sake, I'm fishing somewhere like the Trent and I expect to catch a fair few roach. It's ideal for today. I would expect to catch fish up to 10 or 12 ounces using this. The line is in fact attached on the tip by means of a double rubber. It's quite simple. I'll take that off. The one rubber runs freely up and down the line, whereas the other rubber is fixed permanently on the tip itself. By passing a loop, by passing a loop through a formed loop on the end of the line, it gives me a a loop that in actual fact collapses on itself. That then passes over the pole, pull tight and it locks up behind that first sleeve. The second sleeve then pushes down and drops over the tip of the pole. And believe you me, that never comes off. It's perfect. I had to start, initially, on my elastic rig. That ground bait I placed in a few minutes ago would have started to break up by now. I would imagine, if the river in reasonable condition like it is today, those fish should start to move on quite soon. Once again, it's the old red maggot some reason, you catch a lot more fish in Ireland than any other colour. I think it's something to do with the fact that the majority of people use them. I've got a great belief in, in bronze maggots, but when I come over they always use red for some reason. Now from there onwards, as 
five and a half meters. I then shift the pole, in other words, put the extra sections on to go out to nine meters. Now what I'm gonna do, first of all, I've taken an estimated guess at the peg, it's about seven to eight foot. I'm gonna run it down once or twice. Just to see if I snag up. Now I could plumb the depth, but the problem with this particular peg is, I get the impression it shallows up towards the end because if I look down the swim, it starts to boil a little bit. So if I plumb the depth in front of me, it's eight or nine foot, and then halfway down my peg, it shallows up to six or seven foot. It's a wasted exercise. Now that hasn't dragged at all yet. It should drag down there because of that boil. Now, let's put another few inches on. Six or seven inches on. I was also noticed I'm using a yellow tip float. The reason I'm using that is quite simple. I it picks out the sun when the sun is out. And because I'm fishing opposite those trees, it shows up nicely against the dark background. Let's run it down again. Yeah, that's it. It's dragging under quite seriously there. So I'm going to knock another three or four inches off and I think that is the depth I'm going to concentrate at. Somebody's just set up a rather noisy boat over there. I think there's some fishermen that have been fishing for pike amongst those, those reeds on the far bank. I don't think they've caught any. Tangle around my style. Nice. I must say it's a lovely way to fish this, and there's nothing simpler. When the fish actually move onto the onto the feed, they're so easy to catch. There's nothing difficult about this at all. I'm fishing nine and a half metres at the moment. If you, if you remember a little bit earlier on in the film, I referred to that Shakespeare pole. Believe me, at nine and a half metres, that Shakespeare pole is lovely to use. But I'm using my titanium at the moment. It's a little bit lighter than that Shakespeare one. Now that could have been a bite because I've taken a few inches off. And it shouldn't have dragged there. You notice as well the control you can get over, this, over the float. If you want to stop it, simple, to stop your pole. The float rides out a little bit, but the bait actually lifts up in the water and becomes very enticing. Okay. Let the pole run again, and run it down the swim. Towards the end of the pig, I like to let it run a little bit quicker and something might have a snap at it. Now, also, notice then I didn't have to bring it in. The beauty about fishing with a pole is that you don't have to wind in every time. If you don't get a bite, it's just a matter of bringing the pole up to swim and running your float down again. This ground boat being quite heavy, I would imagine it settled a third of the way down the swim. Was oh, damn, bumped one. Can you believe that? Another mistake's often made, shipped it to the wrong section. Always make a mental note of exactly what section you ship it at. It's nothing worse than when you bring in your rig in. There's a little tangle around the end of this, I'm going to have to put another hook on. Now when I'm pole fishing, be it somewhere like here or even on a canal, I only ever use, use short hook lengths. 
The reason for that is quite simple. I don't like when I've made up the rig to actually have to put additional shotting onto the line itself. So what I do is tie all my hook lengths to anything from what three inches to a foot in length. And then you can cater for all occasions. These these are useful little gadgets. Carry half a dozen hooks on these. The hook itself actually fits over one of the pegs. You wrap your line around two or three times and then drop the end through a little slot. Very convenient these are. To attach the hook to the main line I use a simple half blood knot. On the end of the main line I have a loop. I then pass the hook length line through that loop. Give it a spin two or three times and pass the line see it? Back through the loop again. Quick pull, that is then fixed. It's quite neat and I do find that the anglers, well many years ago, always used to use two loops. It's quite easy to attach, pull one loop through to the other loop and then thread the hook back through itself. But the problem was you end up with two loops forming a little bit of a, I don't know, it's, a, it's like, as it's coming back through the water it spins. Now with this particular method I've noticed that the spinning is reduced quite considerably. And a lot of anglers tie us just a blood knot, which is a no loop on the end of the main line and no loop on the hook length itself. And that, to be honest, is ideal. You get no spinning at all. But to be honest, I've never mastered that knot, so I don't use it. Right, let's rebate. Two maggots. This is a nice way to hold your pole. Feeling a bit lazy, just drop it between your legs. Gives you a free left hand, feed accordingly, and run it down the swim. Unless you do it one handed then. If and when any bream move in the peg, what we might have to do is increase the depth a little bit more. Because bream, they love a relatively stationary bait. In fact, when they move in numbers, you're better off fishing probably two, two and a half foot over depth. they actually keeping the float permanently still. And then the fish just moving, take the bait. But for the moment, until we get some proper indications that there are fish in the peg, we'll just run it along and try and pick up what we can. Only one thing, when that sun goes behind these trees, it goes quite chilly today. A few minutes I was in the sun and once it has moved off, it's gone really cold there. It's a bite, that is definitely a bite. Now you can see the elastic. See it pulling out the tip? Now it's only a roach, but it's pulling a good, what, 18 inches, two foot. For a real big fish, you wouldn't have to actually move the pole, you just anchor the pole and let the elastic do the work. When the fish starts to tire, then you can start to Retrieve the pole. That's quite simple. So, matter of pushing the pole behind you until you get to the optimum section, which is the section you break at, and then from then on, start bringing the fish in. Now, for netting small fish, it always pays to take one extra section off. And the reason we do that is because when you actually bring the fish in, you have to net the thing. And if you've got too much elastic and too much pole up, it just makes it that much more difficult. Pole at the ready. Not a big fish, but I'm only using, you've got to realise I'm only using the English tackle, I'm only on a 16 hook, a pound and a half. Sounds a bit library. Oh no, sorry, rope, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's not a bad start to the day. <coughs> First fish anyway. Lovely fish, perfect again. Look at that, not a mark on the fins. It's really healthy, obviously just just come out of the lock on his way to his spawning grounds, I would imagine. Another four or five weeks' time, this fish could be really rough after his spawn, but at the moment, it's beautiful. You notice my hands are wet all the time. 
the fact I'm mixing my ground bait and messing about and whatever. I like to keep my hands quite wet, especially when catching quite a few fish, because it does help protect the skin. I remember many years ago seeing fishermen handling fish with towels and what have you. I mean, that is absolutely disastrous for the fish because you remove all its natural slime and it can be out with all sorts of diseases. Right, there we go again. Roach. There's obviously no bream there yet. As I'm getting a few bites off Roach, what you find is as soon as you stop getting those bites, now that your bream have moved in. It is important to get the feed going all the time, especially if you are catching a few roach. And I do like it dropping through the peg all the time. Oh, yeah, we're in again. Oh, this is, a big, this is a bigger roach, this one. I don't think it's a skimmer. I don't know, though. No, that's probably good to three or four and five foot of elastic out the pole this time. It could, no. Might be a bream. Bit reluctant to say, yes. <sighs> Whatever it is, it's considerably bigger than some of the fish I've got. Oh. See, all the elastic does all the work for you. There's no need to over pressurise fish or anything. Oh, look at that beautiful roach. This one could be about 14 ounces a pound, this one. Fish. And of course, one of the problems with elastic is that at times the fish can go where they like, and with these reeds to be left, might cause a big problem. Look at that. Come on, then. Oh. Yes, it's a lovely fish. Give it these in there, to be honest. Look at that. Oh, what a lovely. Gorgeous, that is. Absolutely immaculate again. Let's be back in. Get there this time. I think I'm going to get quite a few. It always pays to change your bait. I'll tell you what, that's the fish there at the moment, and that fish didn't damage the bait that much. I'm going to get lazy. It's not going to change. And I did notice that that one actually took the bait quite high up the swim, in fact not far away from where I put the initial barrage of ground bait in. Another bite. Loads of fish there. Yeah. In fact, another couple of three roads like this, I'm going to change them the other rig. Because that's when fishing to hand really comes into its own. Saying that, looking at the way the wind's blowing, it might be a little bit difficult with that rig because there's a lot of extra line because we're fishing the same distance but with a longer pole and more line. I'd end up having a lot of loose line flapping in the wind so I wouldn't get the control. That was definitely a bite. Small roach. There's obviously a few fish there. I'm gonna have a go with the other pole. I'm gonna go and get this one in. Some small roaches. Later in the year, you get these fish really shoulder up here. You'd swing more fish like this. In fact, you'd swing fish up to a pound. But uh, one of the good things try to avoid fishing under trees. But well, you've got to step your hook lengths up for that. I mean, you've got to start fishing two pound bottoms and, and whatever. So I'll go on that with a pole because I'm getting pressure and fishing in there in quite substantial numbers at the moment. So we've got this eight, eight metres of hand rig. 
Seems to be a few fish there. The only problem is, you do tend to lose a little bit of your presentation on this rig. Whereas the wind's not too bad at the moment, hopefully it'll... There won't be a lot to compensate. I'm well, fishing poles over, over 8 metres in length, or eight, well, like, anything up to 14 metres really. I just like to position the pole between my legs and just casually run the float down the peg. Now I've still got a little bit of presentation there because that crease has moved out a little bit further. A little bit lighter than this. Or 8 metres to hand, 2 grab floats. Not responding to this, or some bream on me. Push the roach out. I'll give it another couple of chucks and then we'll go back to our elastic. Try and slow it up a little bit more on this rundown. I don't think this is going to work. Last chuck. If I don't get a fish, I'll go back onto my elastic. It's amazing. One stage, I thought well, there's sufficient fish there to catch on this. Obviously, that little bit of lack of presentation is just making the difference. That lack of presentation is obviously quite significant on the bottom and the fish are just not having it unless it's put at them absolutely perfectly. There, bottom. Give it a miss. Let's get back onto that elastic. Let's see if it was the presentation that made the difference in not catching roach. Might have been coincident, but sometimes the roach just disappear anyway. There's your reason for it, either you've overfed or you threw a, loose ball, a couple of loose balls of ground bait and they've, they've moved somewhere else into your swim. Or you could get a pike or something moving through your peg, but more often not in Ireland, you tend to find that either a shoal of hybrids or a shoal of bream have moved in. Of course, you know what they're like, the ravenous feeders, they move everything else out. Quite a big boisterous fish, especially the hybrids. They're very powerful and just everything else moves out when they move in. Ah, that's better. Now we've got one. Ooh dear. Think about these breathing on this elastic. They certainly go a bit. That is one of the problems. Look at that. That's taken at least eight or ten foot of elastic. The thing about when you're playing bream on this is that you don't just let the elastic do the work. I mean, if that fish is reasonably well hooked, it's just a matter of holding your pole and let the fish actually run backwards and forwards with the elastic itself. It just ties itself out. In actual fact, it ties it itself out quite quickly. When you think the fish is tiring, it's right out there at the moment. It's not ready for the net. Nowhere near. As soon as the elastic starts to creep back, you feel that look, ooh dear, really going. starting to just tire a bit at the moment. And the elastic actually creeps back in itself. You know, look at that, there's only a couple of foot of elastic now, so you, you then know that the fish is actually starting to tire. <laughs> this is a tricky bit, Ooh, getting his head up. Sometimes, if the fish is quite powerful under your feet, and they take a surge for it, you have to put those sections back on again. In actual fact, I'm going to do just this. 
exactly what I can get in every brain, so I might as well make the most of the ones we've got. Just take one section off this time, and then with a bit of luck, it'll come to the net about the right. This one's getting more lively, I don't know about anything else. Come on. That's better, now it's coming. Slight problems here with the trees. Oh, mate, I should be okay if it comes to me. Oh, look at that. Ooh, beauty. Of course, this is where most fish are lost. In this. So you can just put pressure on the pole. The elastic does all the work and eventually it'll just come bobbing up to the surface. Yes, now he's mine. Yeah, number one. Oh, what a lovely fish. It's ever so dark. Look at that, really orange underneath. Smashing fish. A couple of pound. I'll tell you under match conditions, one of these is worth a dozen roach. Beautiful fins. It's not ready for spawning either, yes. It's got none of those little nodules on the top of his nose. I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. As I suspect there's one or two brain there. Let's put a worm on. Nothing, nothing more appetising for a, a bream than those little red worms tipped with a maggot. And that's it's really appetising. And they start to wriggle away on the bottom. A tasty mouthful for any fish. You notice how simple this is. There's no, no, no messing about with rods and, and reels and topping your spools up and so simple. When the first when the pole first came into popularity people thought it was a lot of mystique to it, but to be honest it's one of the simplest forms of fishing. Just hold it steady. Little fish just topped here. He's all alive enough. Bring it down the peg. Yes, it's definitely one. Look at that, see that? Just bob the ones. Just run it, just tease it at them. Sometimes they a little bit apprehensive, you just move the bait fractionally. Just snap and woof. Yeah, it's just one there then. In again. Whoa. <laughs> when they're up they certainly take off. Keep this one down straight this time. It's not the easiest to play. This one's quite as big actually. It's got two and a half as much funny as that other one. Maybe the last one didn't start to come in quite till it got quite close. Oh, and now he's he realised he's up now. <laughs> That's not as big as that last one. That one, I mean, look at this. Yeah, a small one, this one. Match conditions, these are far easier to catch. Well, more easy to land than the bigger ones. Yeah, that's only about ten and a half of them. Bit of a scrappy fish, actually. Look at that. It's got a bit of a dilapidated tail of fins there. He's been rubbing himself up against the gravel, I imagine. Certainly a quick reaction to that worm. Let's find another one. The thing about this elastic is it's always best to keep it wet all the time. What I normally do is just dip the tip in the river and just give it a few stretches. As it's wet, it just slides look nice and easily back into the middle of the pole. If it gets too dry, it tends to jerk in and out rather than come out smoothly. Let's get back in position. 
basically, it's just sitting here in these surrounds is enough, catching fish or not, and catching fish is an additional bonus. All of the urn waterways are high of activity, especially on a, a weekend. We've got some rowers out there now. I don't seem to be doing very well. Oh, I'm going around in circles. There are loads of cruisers on it. They seem to emerge at the weekends, especially on a nice day. I think there's one there at the moment. It's runny sat him, yes, look at that. <laughs> Can't miss bites like that, can you? Whoa, dear. That fish really took off. <laughs> this one's running inside. Oh, it is, it's not a big fish. Stop it. No, no, it's going. No, this is not a bream. I get the impression this could be an hybrid. Ferocious little fighters, these things. It's going to take a bit of time, this one. Look at that. Come on, now he's out in that current, he's going to take some. When you get a fish this size, it's just patience, really. I mean, OK, we're not in a match situation today. We're not trying to break any records. So it's just a matter of just being a little bit patient and making it steady, making every fish. Ooh, <laughs> now he's took off again. Now that is ridiculous. Come on, come on. Get rid of It's definitely an hybrid. Right to the surface then. Yeah. Come to the top. Problem is now, it's come to the top a bit too far out. We've got to drag him all the way in. To be honest, I should have put another section on then and actually pushed him further out then. I think I've got him there, yeah, it's coming up. So it's not a big fish, but do they fight? Yeah. Oh, well, good little fighters, these hybrids. So he's not a big fish. About pound four, pound six. I'll tell you what, they give good value for money at the end of your ride. You can see the difference between the, the hybrid and the bream. Much bigger scales, slightly reddier fins. Not such a big fin at the base here. Very powerful tail. Got the thickness of a, of a roach, the depth of a bream. You get some, some days here, we, that's all you can catch, hybrids. And I'll tell you what, at the end of a five hour session catching them, you know, you've had a day's fishing. I do not, I don't know for what reason, there's very, very few places in England and I know you can catch those hybrids. I know Woodsboro Reservoir in Barnsley. It's got some very big hybrids in there. But I don't know a lot of other places. Let's go again. I don't know about a fair day sport. I made a few mistakes. I bumped a few fish earlier on. I had one or two spells where well, I've just lost track of the fish really. I think it was a transition period between the roach moving out and the, and the bream moving in that, that caused that. With any day's fishing, nothing always goes perfectly to plan. We all make mistakes. Hang on. Thought that was a bite. It was. Oh, we're in again. This one's taking some elastic. Let's just see how long it takes to tire itself, this one. Sharp move the pole, let's see how long it takes to come to the top. That's when you just know that the elastic's doing its work. Yeah. 
creeping back already. Now it's running again. I remember watching the World Championships in Vienna about, must have been about nine or ten years ago. Yeah, now the floats come out. Now, I haven't moved the pole. The elastic has just started to bring the floats and now the fish has surged again and taken it away. That's taken what? 12, 14 foot of elastic. There you are now. Now the floats come out as the elastic's creeping back in. Now you can see it's slowly creeping out. Yeah, the fish is tiring now. Put a bit more pressure on. And the eventual winner, Jean-Pierre Fougier. In fact, uh, he won the World Championships last year as well. I think he's won, he has won it twice now. There's an Italian chap at the next peg who was on the end peg winning the match. And to all intents and purposes, Jean-Pierre was well out of the game. And all of a sudden, boom, it's this bream. Now one of the Mouskin circumstances that you think no big deal one bream. And all of a sudden you realise that the world crown could be yours if you just get with one fish out. And all of a sudden the pressure gets immense. And all he did, he stopped the butt of the pole in the floor. Stuck his pole up in the air, I think he was fishing about nine metres that day, and just talked to the crowd for ten minutes, I couldn't believe it. Ten minutes later, whoop, fish comes up on the surface, as this one will, eventually. Nets it, four pound bream, world champion. Never ever seen anything so cool in all my life. Not as much pressure on me on this fish, I'll show you. Oh no, he has got some spawning nodules on him. He's on his way up the lock. Another nice condition fish. Watch. Net full of them in the fourth coming festivals will go down well. Well that's it. I've had a cracking week stay in Northern Ireland. Bought a fair few fish. Got drenched a few times. All in all, very enjoyable. Summarising today, okay, I expected to catch on the eight metre pole to hand. It's just, well, just one of them things. Fishing's unpredictable. Just weren't quite right for that today. The fish just wanted that little bit of extra presentation and bingo, we caught straight off. A little bit lucky initially to catch a few roach. I think had I started on eight metre pole then, I might have actually been able to demonstrate swing into hand and, and what have you. But the ironical thing is, as soon as I changed to it, they were drifting away from me anyway. I should have made the decision a little bit earlier. We all make mistakes. One thing about pole fishing is you must always keep things simple. It can be an expensive sport. Poles can be very expensive. But there's no need to buy expensive poles. Could have fished today with a pole. I've only fished nine and a half metres. You can buy a good quality nine and a half metre pole for, well, less than 100 pounds. But the best piece of advice is really to buy as long a pole as you possibly can. You can always keep sections on the bank behind you. And one of these days you might hook one of those really big hybrids or a really big bream and you'll have to put an extra section on and then you'll be screaming at yourself, damn, I wish I'd have bought an extra pole, extra section. Balance tackle's always important as well. And that's why we try to show most of all today. Did you notice the thick elastic I was using? And if I was in England and I was using a thick elastic, I wouldn't dream of using it with a 12 ounce bottom. It's just not balanced. With thick elastic like that, you have to be using pound, pound and a half, pound and three quarter, even two pound breaking strain lines. When you come down to the very fine elastic on canals, that's when you go down to your eight ounce and your 12 ounce. Keep your tackle balanced. The rigs we use are two of the simplest rigs you could ever use. Just a standard bulk, two or three feet away from the hook with a couple of droppers. Simplicity in itself. I hope you've learnt a little bit today. And who knows, by the start of the season coming, you'll go out and buy yourself a pole and thoroughly enjoy yourself. That shadow of a day has been really interesting and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Let's have a look what we've got. Let's get this fish out. Not a bad day, Smith. Maybe just about 30 pounds, 25, 28 pounds, something like that. There we go, slip him back. Catch 
them all again soon, I hope.